everyone. Today I'm going to walk you through a real case study from my office. This is a 40-year-old woman with Meniere's disease, and this particular patient is experiencing uh, fluctuating hearing loss in the right ear, uh, fluctuating tinnitus in the right ear, fluctuating ear pain and pressure, and she's aware of her ear daily, right? Like she, it's such a distraction because her hearing has changed. She's got this tinnitus. Uh, just imagine that. That would be incredibly annoying. Now, a few weeks before she saw me, she was experiencing rotational vertigo, uh, which is not something she experienced for the first time. So, if you have Meniere's disease and you're struggling and wondering, you know, what to do, uh, I think you're going to find this video very helpful because I'm going to walk you through her history, what we learned from that, what kind of tests do we need to do, and what her response to the treatment was. So, let's get into it. All right, so if we start with her history, what does it tell us? Well, originally this started about five years ago in September and October of 2018. She was moving across the United States, starting a new business. Her stress level is very high, and we know stress is incredibly physically inflammatory, uh, biochemically speaking. She was also exposed to a lot of new environmental antigens. Uh, she started experiencing pressure in the right ear. She had a plugged feeling in the right ear, and her hearing was heavily muffled. So that may not be Meniere's disease, but that's certainly telling you we're having an inner ear problem. Okay. A couple months after that, she woke up in the middle of the night with rotational vertigo, really loud tinnitus, and she began vomiting and having diarrhea, and that's telling you we probably have Meniere's, right? So Meniere's is this uh, endolymphatic hydrops. It's, a, it's a, a crushing from the inside out of the inner ear caused by excessive fluid. Generally speaking, and I'm going to say 90% of the cases that I see, it's an inflammatory problem from somewhere. Uh, it's either uh, an autoimmune condition attacking the inner ear, but that's not that common. More common is you've got an inflammatory problem, the immune system's reacting, and your ear is just the weak link, and that's, that's where it's hitting you. So the ear symptoms eventually cleared. She saw an ENT and said, yeah, your hearing's normal, but suggested, yeah, you probably have Meniere's disease. But really don't offer any treatment, right? Um, March and April of that same year, she had a second episode of this dizziness and vertigo, uh, because she had she got a little bit tipsy. Uh, the next day after the intoxication, she had the nausea, felt off like if she was in a dreamlike state. She had disequilibrium. Uh, she took some meclizine, which is kind of a standard vestibular system sedative, did an Epley's maneuver. Who knows if that was really appropriate? Uh, but there were no ear symptoms that time. There was just strictly vestibular, no cochlear symptoms. Now, in March of, May, excuse me, May of 2019, she saw an ENT who put a tube in her ear, her tympanic membrane, like you, like you would do for a kid with earaches, uh, with chronic ear infections, which gave her really, really worse tinnitus. So they took that out. <laughs> Two days after that, she had another episode of auditory negative disequilibrium, right? Uh, but without the tinnitus. So she's having a lot of, uh, a couple different episodes of these vestibular uh, symptoms, but not as much auditory symptoms. Now, after that, though, she saw a physical therapist for lymphatic drainage, you know, hoping that would help. Saw another phys physical therapist who uh, was a, quote, inner ear specialist. She saw another ENT who recommended oral steroids because her hearing was diminished at that time. He also put her on a low-salt diet, which, again, kind of a standard thing. Uh, and the reason they do that is uh, sodium, you know, salt brings water with it. And the idea is if you have a lot of sodium, you bring water with it, that can increase uh, the pressure in your ear because you have a, you have a defined space in there, right? Also, though... Uh, sodium is a booster of a particular part of your immune system called TH17, which can promote autoimmunity and promote inflammation. So that's another reason why a low-salt diet might work or it might not. Now, she followed that low-salt diet for, you know, 18 months. She didn't feel like the steroids really did that much to her symptoms. So, so far, we're, I'm telling you, oh, it sounds like it could be an immune system or inflammation problem. But, you know, she took steroids, which are an immune system squasher, and didn't do anything. Okay, well, let's just follow and see what she says. Now, then she tried beta histine and the ear tube uh, was taken out. So, beta histine is a medication that's kind of controversial. Most ENTs in America won't, won't, won't use it. Some people say there's not really any good evidence for it. Uh, and as we'll find out with this patient, it maybe wasn't doing that much for her either, but it's basically a inner ear uh, vascular vasodilator, right? And the idea is that if you dilate the vessels, uh, it can relieve some of the, the fluid pressure in there. I don't know if anyone really knows if that's what happens, but uh, certainly some people respond to it, or we think they do. Now, she also tried Zyrtec. Now, what's that? That's an anti-allergy medication. Uh, it works on histamine. And the next morning after taking the Zyrtec, her ear felt very, very clear, but then it stopped working eventually. Uh, she also had a TMJ appliance at that time. We're not going to go off too often into that rabbit hole. 
Now, in the spring of 2020, she saw a new otologist who recommended increasing the beta histine. And the first night after the increased dose, her ear was unblocked and her hearing felt normal. But then she began experiencing ear pain on and off in the front of the ear. Now, this is interesting, right? So when they did this big vasodilator thing, it helped temporarily, right? And same thing with the Zyrtec, which is kind of a, more of an immune-based thing that helped temporarily. Now, summer of 2022, this is the big red letter thing I want to show you guys. She had an upper respiratory virus, which flared up all of her symptoms. Now, what happens when you have an upper respiratory virus? virus? Well, your immune system is stimulated. And so when that immune system kicks up, all of her symptoms kicked up. So for me, I'm looking at that going, well, that definitely tells us that her immune system's involved, but I don't know if it's because um, that was an abnormal response or just because, you know, she got, in, she got inflamed and then, you know, the, the symptoms appeared. I don't know if it's abnormal what happened, but I do know that having an immune system, a challenge, flared up her symptoms. So I'm going to put that in my pocket and hold on to it. She saw an ENT for what's called intratympanic steroid injections, where they literally put a needle through your eardrum and give you steroids. Uh, to try to de-inflame the area, which did seem to help for two to three months. Okay, we're going to put that in our pocket as well. And then she went back to what her symptoms were originally. So it was a temporary help, but then they went back. So there's something going on in there that is not resolving, right? Because she gets a little bit of improvement and then she backtracks. A little bit of improvement and then she backtracks. So two more intertympanic injections uh, have produced no significant change. So, you know, there's kind of a mixed bag on whether this is an immune system sort of problem or not an immune system problem. So the family history, ah, got a brother with multiple sclerosis, that's an autoimmune condition. She has a sister with a Crohn's disease, which is an autoimmune condition. So you know where my mind goes. My mind goes, okay, well, this lady very likely has an autoimmune problem or, or something similar to it, and that may be what's driving the Meniere thing, because I've seen that a hundred times. But we gotta test and find out. Now her diet is not restricted. She's not really avoiding salt. She's not avoiding gluten or dairy, anything like that. And that's going to be important for us because perhaps if we find out she's got an autoimmune problem, there's going to be a potential for help because, you know, her diet isn't restricted currently. And if she's got an autoimmune problem, we're probably going to have to change her diet. Uh, currently, this is important, she is taking uh, levothyroxine. So she got diagnosed hypothyroid at some point, right? Which is interesting. She could really make a big deal about that. I don't know if that's Hashimoto's or not, but she is taking levothyroxine. And you don't take that unless you get diagnosed hypothyroid. She's also taking something called low-dose naltrexone, and she's not sure that's helpful at all. And I don't want to get a bunch of hate mail from people that love uh, LDN, but low-dose naltrexone is an indirect TH1 cytokine booster, okay? And so what that means is, is if you don't know your immunophenotype, you have a chance of that working, you have a chance of that uh, not working, and you have a chance of it making you worse. And she's not sure it's helpful at all. Now, it's really promoted as sort of a panacea for all sorts of like autoimmune stuff and inflammatory things. And for certain people, if you know their immunophenotype, then yeah, it might be appropriate. But generally speaking, I'm not that big of a fan of it. I don't think it works that great uh, in most cases that I've seen. She's also taking a whole bunch of stuff, right? Look at these things. She's taking N-acetylcysteine, glutathione, curcumin, magnesium, D, lithium orotate, and adrenal cortex. That stuff looks pretty good, right? Good. Uh, there's nothing in there I'm worried about. But, you know, she's taking some overtly anti-inflammatory things, but she still has her symptoms. So I got to tell you, my mind goes, well... She's already had steroids that worked a little bit, but then stopped working. She's taking, you know, these anti-inflammatory things that don't really seem to be nailing it. So maybe that's not what's going on. We're going to have to dig. So a recent audiogram right when she saw me showed that she had a, a moderate sensory neural hearing loss in her right ear. Speech recognition thresholds were uh, higher. You know, she had to, things had to be louder for her to hear him in the right ear. And she just had, you know, prior to seeing me not too long before, she had some recent blood chemistry, which was pretty thorough urinary organic acid, but it was all pretty unremarkable. She had an IgE food test that showed that she was IgE re reactive to egg whites, which means that's more of like of an immediate uh, kind of allergy type response. And then the IgG part of that showed, check this out, uh, sensitive to 37 foods. Now, I don't want to, again, go off on a soapbox too much about IgG food testing, but essentially uh, it is not what you think it is. Uh, I could talk about it for a long time. I don't do it on patients. I used to do it years ago, and then I realized this is essentially random. Because really, all an IgG food test is going to show you is that your immune system has seen a food. Doesn't mean it's having a bad reaction. Uh, I finally got a person from a lab to say, <laughs> uh, just because it's positive doesn't mean it's causative, right? So 
in a large and a very large part, IgG food testing is not that helpful. Uh, what shows up is the stuff you eat the most, and there are things that are going to show up that you never eat, right? Like if you never eat persimmons and then persimmon shows up, you got to ask yourself, why would persimmon show up if I don't eat persimmons? Because there's a problem. So anyway, IgG test sensitive to 37 foods. Should she eliminate all 37 foods? Well, no, she didn't. Uh, and that's a good thing because it really, I don't think it has much to do with this case, uh, partly because that testing I think is problematic. Anyway, so we don't need to really check all that blood chemistry we just had, right? But I did order, because I've been thinking about her immune system, right? I did order a multiple tissue autoimmune reactivity test and a comprehensive lymphocyte immunophenotyping test because I know what those mean. I know how to interpret them. So let's see what they show. But before I show you the results, I want to tell you something. You know, before she did those immune system tests, I had her stop taking all those supplements because I want to see what is your immune system doing if you don't take all that stuff. And here's what we found out. Um, she didn't resume. I said, hey, don't take that stuff and, and don't, don't, don't start it once you stop taking. I had her stop for about seven to 10 days. And since she stopped taking those things, she really hasn't noticed anything, right? She really hasn't noticed anything except there was an improvement in her audiogram about two weeks after that. Now, I don't know if it's because she stopped taking those things. Maybe something she was taking wasn't helpful. I don't know. Uh, but there was a little bit of a change. But otherwise, there was no change in the fluctuating tinnitus or the ear pain and that kind of stuff, right? I bring that up because sometimes people are taking things that they shouldn't be taking. Uh, they just don't know it, right? They don't know what their immunophenotype is and just not working with someone who can tell them, hey, maybe you shouldn't take that. So anyway, uh, here's what her multiple tissue autoimmune reactivity panel showed. And again, what this is, this is uh, looking for tissue antibodies, right? We're looking if there's an autoimmune problem. And this kind of casts a wide net. This kind of goes stomach. I'm not going to go through all these, but the point is because hers were normal, right? I mean, look at that. Like this green is in range. She doesn't have any of those things. And um, even when it comes to the thyroid stuff, right? Because she has, she's been taking levothyroxine, doesn't look like Hashimoto's, right? So my first thought is, well, she doesn't have any of those antibodies. That doesn't mean that she has no autoimmune problem, but it's kind of, you know, really arguing against there being an autoimmune problem. So what I can do to kind of confirm if her immune system is an issue or there's an autoimmune problem is I can then look at this test because there's nothing here. Uh, we can look at this test, which is the lymphocyte map, right? So this base, basically this is a, a immune system fingerprint test, right? The point is by looking at direct measurements of these, all these immune system cells and looking at their ratios, you can find out what someone's immunophenotype is. And that just means what does their immune system look like? What is it doing? And just because she has Meniere's, we don't know what her immune system looks like, right? You can give me a hundred people with Meniere's disease and they can all have their own fingerprint and they can all have their own immune system fingerprint. So we need to test it to see what is it actually doing to find out what do I need to do, right? Because you can't tell what someone's immune system is doing just by their symptoms. Now, you put a gun to my head and force me to treat someone without knowing what their phenotype is, I can do it, but this helps me be more efficient because check this out, there's not much going on, right? It doesn't look like it. If you look low, high, and in range, let's just walk through this real quickly. Well, her B cells are, are, are kind of borderline low, right? 92 is on the low end, 6.2 is on the low end, so that makes the T cell B cell ratio off. And if you know anything about B cells, what that may implicate is she may have poor immunological memory um, because B cells make antibodies, right? Now she's not deficient in those, but she may have a bit of a capacity problem there. Maybe what's happening is she's getting exposed to different things like a virus or allergen or something, and her immune system is not remembering that it was exposed to it. So she is not as resistant to those things, right? She has the same sort of reaction again and again and again as she would have the first time she was exposed to it. I don't know if that makes sense or not, but uh, if we look at this, the CD4 is uh, a little on the low end, so that makes the ratio a little bit low. And then the TH1, TH2, 17, that stuff all looks fine. So I'm gonna just tell you, that's not looking like an autoimmune patient. Um, that's not looking like someone who has multiple sclerosis or Crohn's disease or Hashimoto's. Like there's just not enough asymmetry in those things. Uh, that's not what it looks like. But what we do see down here, you see these natural killer cell markers? Essentially, the only thing that's really gonna elevate those or the most common thing that's gonna elevate those is some sort of chronic pathogen, like a virus, maybe a bacteria, maybe mold, you know, something like that. Um, and, and that's pretty much it. Now, I looked at that and said, well, here's what let's do. I looked at her history and said, well, we've tried all these different anti-inflammatory things. They don't really do anything. So I'm not gonna just do that again because 
it's looking like she doesn't need it. But I put together a little hypothesis and I said, well, if the natural killer cells are elevated, maybe she's got a chronic viral problem of some kind. Now, granted, this isn't like a perfect example of those sort of results that would prove that, but that's what I thought. I thought, well, we're going to go for it because I'm going to give it 30 days, maybe 60 days, and then we're going to, that'll tell us if it's actually better, right? We're going to have a bar, a standard to let us know, is she better or not? So I'm thinking, let's do some things to improve B cells and let's do something to help her uh, immune system potentially clear whatever this pathogen is, probably viral if it's anything, right? So again, I'm not going to tell you exactly what I gave her because I don't want you doing that to yourself. I don't want you self-treating because that's a mistake. You don't even know what your phenotype is. This may, this may even be good for you. This may be terrible for you to do that. So I'm not going to show you exactly what I did, but I will tell you how she responded. So after 30 days, she says, man, I've been really good in the last 30 days. I've had no tinnitus, no ear pain, no ear pressure. She's maintaining the hearing improvement that she'd got a couple weeks, you know, after stopping the supplements that she was taking. This is good. I like this. This says, okay, now her symptoms do wax and wane, but remember she was aware of her ear daily. So this is quite a big improvement. So I'm immediately thinking, okay, this might be good. So what about two months into it? Well, two months into it, I, she had one week before I talked to her where she had a few hours of a little high pitched tinnitus that kind of waxed and waned. That's not the end of the world because yes, it wasn't nothing, but it wasn't something she was having every day. So she's had one little episode of it. She's had a little bit of ear pain, which kind of coincided with the tinnitus, but that's still an improvement. And there's been no decline in the hearing improvement. Okay. So this is all very, very good stuff. So I'm going to follow up with her in about two months, right? She's had no vertigo, by the way, right? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to follow up with her in about two months because she's feeling quite good. And if in two months she's still doing well, we're probably going to retest that lymphocyte map and find out have those natural killer cells come down and normalized? Because if they have, then perhaps my hypothesis was correct. But we know that something we're doing is working because all these symptoms she was having are essentially gone. Now, why do I show you this video? Because Meniere's is a complex uh, condition and not everybody has the same flavor of Meniere's. Most people I see have more of a kind of inflammatory autoimmune sort of thing, but that's not what she had, right? And I didn't waste time treating it like that because the history told me that that's not what she had. And you know, the stuff that she was taking wasn't helping. So why waste time? So I made this video to show you that if you have Meniere's disease, you know, someone with Meniere's disease, there's stuff you can do. There is hope, but you're going to have to work with someone that understands all these things that we talked about today, right? Someone that understands how to look at a history, how to interpret it, how to order the test, what test should they order, how to interpret the tests, how to figure out what the treatment's going to be. And how do we find out if it's working, right? How do we find out if it's working? That's a big order. You know, that's, a, that's a big task to find, but you can find someone like that. And just remember that if you have Meniere's, you don't have to suffer. You don't have to settle for suffering. You can get better. You just got to make sure you're working with the right kind of doctor. Okay. I'll see you next time.